Hey church, so great to be with you again this morning. My name is Tyler. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Westview and welcome uh, to our morning service. Today we're in our second to last Sunday in this series we're calling By Faith. This moment that we find ourselves in as we look at Hebrews 11, these individuals, men and women who live lives of, of great faith and whose lives really serve as an opportunity for us to take inspiration and encouragement and to do likewise. Here in Hebrews 11, 30 to 31 that we'll be looking at this morning, the author reminds us of two instances where great faith was demonstrated, but by two very different individuals and people groups. Then in our message this morning, we're going to look at God's people as they walk in obedience and faith to truly what seems like illogical and, and very odd commands that God would give But before we go any further, church, uh, would you pray with me this morning? Uh, Jesus, we do thank you that as we gather in our homes this morning as your church, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would continue to remind us that we are the church. Whether we're gathered together or apart, there is still a mission to which you are calling us to. And so speak to us this morning. Equip us by the power of your spirit to do what you have created each one of us for. And remind us through your word this morning, through these stories, the examples of of Israel's history, of what it really looks like to walk in faith. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, maybe just hit pause and and go to our website where we have our sermon notes. If you want to uh, download those to help you engage with our text this morning, I always encourage you to do so. We're in Hebrews chapter 11. We're looking at verses 30 and 31. So I invite you to open your Bibles or or turn on your Bible apps and join with me in those scriptures. And we'll be looking at a few others as well uh, back from the book of Joshua. But the first part that I want to look at this morning, the first story I want us to go and look at is, is Jericho, this moment in the Old Testament. Let me set the scene for you a bit here this morning. So following the exodus from Egypt where Moses, who we looked at last week, led the Israelites out of slavery and oppression by Pharaoh, and following in their wandering in the desert for the past 40 years, they're now set to enter into the promised land. This land promised to them by their ancestors, by the Lord. So now, under the leadership of Joshua, the Israelites are camped on the outskirts of the city of Jericho on the east side of the Jordan River. And so we read in our text this morning in Hebrews 11.30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. So at the beginning of Joshua chapter 6, we read these instructions that Joshua receives from the Lord as they prepare to take the city of Jericho and as they prepare to enter into the promised land. So join with me in Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times, with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear the sound of a long blast in the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Seems fairly straightforward and logical, right? I mean, if you grew up going to Sunday school, you probably loved recreating this scene in your class. It's less likely that your Sunday school teacher enjoyed this as much as you did, because I can imagine that the kids, as they walked around the classroom, blowing their kazoos or their recorders or or what other instrument of war, I mean, I mean, musical instrument, uh, you know, they had at their disposal. And I'm pretty sure that it wasn't a ram's horn, that it probably was a recorder used by Israelites army. Because let's be honest, if someone blew a recorder around the city wall seven times, I'm pretty sure I would be the first one to surrender, 
rather than have to put up with that for another moment. But as we read the account of the Israelites, as they are led by Joshua to conquer Jericho, we do see a few key themes emerge that help us to understand the heart of the Lord in all of this. And the first point I want us to look at this morning is this, that the Lord's plans are not always immediate. You see, the Israelites knew that the Lord had covenanted with Abraham that they would one day enter into the promised land. But likely none of them anticipated the journey that they would have been taken on in order to see this come to its fullest completion. The exodus from Egypt, the wandering in Sinai for 40 years, In times like these in my own life, where I feel anxious, where I feel unsure of if or when these plans I truly sense the Lord has revealed to me ought to be coming to bear. In those moments in my life, I find myself turning to 2 Peter. Let me read that for us this morning. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, for any of us who feel that the Lord has has promised us something, we need to hear these words. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Yours and my understanding of the Lord's timing is critical in our understanding of his nature and character. I mean, I'll be the first one to admit I'm not always the most patient person. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who will admit that, that that patience is one of those fruits of the spirit that you wish you'd see more growth in as a Christ follower. And I think this was true for the Israelites as they waited for what felt like an eternity for that final culmination of this covenant that the Lord made, that they would one day finally enter into the promised land. And the Lord has been very active in my own life at teaching me patience. Because this flows into my second point this morning, that the Lord's plans are not always logical. There's no place where I think this is made clearer than is recorded in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 55, eight to nine says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, while this method of conquering Jericho may not have seemed normative to you and me, We are not God. And I think it's an important thing for us to really understand. R.T. Kendall, in his book on Hebrews 11 that I've been using a lot in the preparation of this sermon, said what God commanded here was the most curious, if not ridiculous advice God ever gave to intelligent people. You see, even R.T. Kendall understands that this is bizarre, that this is not normative, that this is illogical, and it just seems to defy any sense of normality where you and I would understand the plans of the Lord. But we need to remember that God's ways are far better than ours. But here in our text, despite the illogical commands of the Lord, look at what transpires next. Look at Joshua 6, 6 to 7. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and of seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, Advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. So this was day one. And this continued day after day as Joshua and the Israelites marched around the fortified city of Jericho carrying the Ark of the Covenant and blasting their recorders or ram's horns. But just pause for me for a moment and think if you were the Israelite army, is this how you would have drawn up plans to conquer a city? 
by grabbing your marching band buddies and having a week-long parade. So R.T. Kendall goes on to say this, by any man's judgment, this advice must be regarded as sheer nonsense. And so it is, unless it is what God says to do. Because we need to remember that just because the Lord's plans, just because they may appear to us to be weird, doesn't mean they won't work. Maybe you've heard this story before, but there's a story told of, of a mountain climber who is desperate to conquer one of the highest peaks in the Americas. He initiated his climb after years of preparation. He wanted the glory. He wanted the glory to himself. And so he set out on this trek alone. He started climbing, and as it became later and later, he, he really began to realize that it was going to get dark sooner than he anticipated. And so night fell with heaviness at a very high altitude. Visibility was almost zero. Everything was black that evening. There was no moon and no stars. They were all covered by the clouds. And as he was climbing this ridge and he reached about 100 meters from the top, he slipped and fell, falling rapidly to the bottom, only really seeing splotches of darkness as he flew by. He felt this terrible sensation of being sucked down by gravity. He kept falling and falling in these moments in his life, just of getting more anxious and worried, fearing that obviously what was to come in a few moments was his certain death. And then in an instant, there was this jolt as his rope caught. And he cried out in that moment, God, help me, help me. And all of a sudden, just like the good God he is, he hears this voice cry down, cut the rope. He cries out again, no, Lord, save me, save me. He hears his voice, do you really believe I can save you? Yes, Lord, save me. And then he feels this sensation again, this voice in his head, cut the rope. Overwhelmed by anxiety and fear and the cold of the evening, he finally succumbs to the elements and passes away, unable to cut the rope because of an unknown experience of what would have awaited him. A few days later, a rescue team arrives on the scene and finds the man dangling from the rope two feet off the ground. Maybe you've heard the story before. Whether or not it's true remains to be told, but it's a story where in our lives there are these moments where it seems like what God is asking us to do is so peculiar, so illogical, so otherworldly that how could that ever be something that we should do? Well, we can take heart that the Apostle Paul reminds us of something similar in the book of Romans. In Romans 8, 28, we read this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, for that climber, he just needed to cut the rope and trust to have faith that what God was calling him to do was for his good. It was what was best for him that could have meant for his survival in that time. We read here in verse 20 that the Lord's promise came to fruition, that his plan did prevail. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the walls collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city You see, despite the peculiarity, despite how bizarre these plans were, the plan worked. You see, God did what he promised, and the walls came down. God shows his glory only when there can be no natural explanation for it. I think far too often we steal God's thunder by by our own intellect and power, feeling like we get the glory, we get the praise for what was able to transpire. But this robs God of his glory. And God loves to defy natural explanations for what he does. 
He is and will ever be the God of miracles. It's incredible even to research some of the archaeological elements that surround the city of Jericho as recorded here in the book of Joshua. Kathleen Kenyon, who studied this area in 1952 to 1958, found in her reports that she filed the mud brick walls at the base of what would have been the retaining wall in Jericho agreeing with the biblical account. The mud brick wall was on top of the retaining wall and when fallen would have provided this this kind of natural ramp that the Israelite army would have used to have climbed up and conquer Jericho. But before all these plans of Joshua came to fruition, before the Israelite army even marched around the walls of Jericho, and before those walls came tumbling down, were the plans and work of another character in this story. And it's our second point that I want us to look at, the story of Rahab. So rewind with me a bit more before the walls of Jericho fell, before all the horrific sounds of the elementary school recorders or ram's horns, as Joshua and the Israelites were still camped outside of the promised land, what Joshua does is he spent, sends two spies in from Shittim to check out Jericho. We read that in Joshua 2.1. Yet we are told that in verse 2, that the king of Jericho catches wind that there are spies. There are spies in the city, and he he seeks out to, to understand what's going on. And we read in Joshua 2, the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. So here in our text, we're introduced to Rahab. Rahab's life is a great story filled with many lessons, but but we can't miss out this one point as we begin here this morning. Rahab was a prostitute. This was her trade. And it's likely that these two spies hid there because people would have become accustomed to have seen individuals coming in and out of her house at any odd hours of the day. It would have been a good place for anyone seeking intel on the comings and goings on of what was happening in the city to have found this place. We also know from our text that Rahab was a Canaanite. These were Israel's sworn enemies and also a woman. These factors alone would have made her triply marginalized in her community. But what is profound to note from our story this morning is her great faith. There can be no question that the Bible is full of surprises. And this surprise to see in our text this morning, a female Canaanite prostitute included in the hall of faith confirms one thing, that this is an account that demonstrates the way God sometimes seems to break all the rules that we have defended and lived by for years. You see, we can feel like we've figured God out, that we've figured him all out, that we've kind of put him into this neat, conservative, evangelical box. But then how in the world do you explain this? How do you explain this story in the scriptures? And so we read in our text this morning in Hebrews eleven thirty one, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. You see, it's clear in our text this morning that Rahab becomes a follower of the Lord and is a great, a person, sorry, of great faith. But what she is remembered for by mostly is that she told a bold-faced lie. Let's pick it up in verse four in chapter two. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hid them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. 
So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Just think about that for a moment. A liar, a harlot, a Canaanite, a woman. I mean, you wouldn't think she would have much chance of making this list, but she does. And what's truly remarkable that we see from this text is from this newfound faith, she asks a big ask. And beginning in verse 12, we read this. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hill so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. Now the man has said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you have let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all of your family into your house. And we pick it up in verse 21. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Rahab asks a big ask and God delivers with even bigger plans for this woman's life. Not just is her life spared when the Israelites conquer Jericho, but Rahab eventually marries into the Israelite family of believers and becomes the great, great grandmother of King David and is even included in the genealogy of Jesus found in Matthew's gospel. Look at what's said of her in the the book of James. He mentions her in chapter 2, verse 25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? What is truly remarkable from this testimony is that God can work in anyone's life. And I think that's what brings us to our final point as we conclude our sermon this morning. This idea of faith for the ordinary and not just for the extraordinary. Looking at these two accounts in the hall of faith here in Hebrews 11, I've come to one conclusion. And maybe the entire sermon could be kind of put into this one point. It's this, it's that great faith is not just reserved for those who in the eyes of culture have it all together, who appear to have it all figured out. Because how interesting that the two individuals who are included here in the hall of faith and who are subsequently placed next to each other are Joshua and Rahab. One who was revered as he led the people into the promised land. And the other one who would have been looked down upon and ostracized by her community. But it's not enough to look at the lives of Joshua or Rahab to idolize their faith, their courage. No, that's not the point of the sermon. Nor do I think it's truly the ultimate point of their stories. You see, their stories, their lives, well, I think they point us to something greater. And not just to something, but to someone. Do you remember back in the story of Rahab, that that scarlet cord? That cord that Rahab was to leave outside of that window so that she and her family would be saved when the Israelites came to conquer Jericho? Maybe, just maybe, there's some foreshadowing here of the saving of many more lives through the scarlet, crimson blood of Christ. 
You see, Rahab had to place her trust and her faith in that scarlet cord. It was her only hope to be saved, to be rescued. And it's no different still for our lives today. You see, our only hope to be saved, our only hope to be rescued is to put our hope and our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. As it says in Romans chapter 10, verses 10 to 13, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. These two stories we've looked at today The story of Joshua, this great leader, commissioned with the task of leading the Israelites into the promised land. A man of great stature who experiences great victory in his life. And then again, the story of Rahab, ostracized. Thought of as lesser than by her community. As seen as one of faith, of great faith to be included here in Hebrews 11. And so for you and I, as we look upon these stories this morning, as we look upon what does it mean to live lives of great faith, what we see from these stories is that God can and will use anyone that we don't have to have it all figured out, that we don't have to have it all together. Whether we are the victorious leader or the ostracized individual, God has created us for a purpose. He has a plan for our lives. And that begins by trusting, by putting our faith. Just as Rahab put her faith in that scarlet cord, so we are called to put our hope, our faith, our trust in Jesus. Remembering the scarlet crimson blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins so that we too could be a part of God's family. That we too could be a part of what God's calling us all to, his purpose and mission still so church, this morning, as we look at these two stories, we are reminded of what it means to have great faith, what it means to put our hope in God. And by doing so, he will accomplish great things through each one of us. Pray with me. Lord, I do thank you this morning for the examples of Joshua, of the Israelite army as they marched around Jericho, for the story of Rahab and her great faith I thank you, Lord, that you can use each one of us. You will use each one of us who have put our hope and trust in your son, in Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for this time together. Continue to challenge us and equip us for the work that you are calling us to. We pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.